Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to virtual worship today at Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. My name is Stephen Ratliff, the pastor here. I also want to thank folks helping with worship this morning. Um, Scott Stinson is doing several jobs today. We thank him for being liturgist, soloist, as well as working on tech support. And for Bonnie Stinson and her technical expertise, we say thank you this morning. Well, I have an announcement about uh, in-person worship at Indian Trail Presbyterian. As many of you know, we had set July 5th as a possible return date to worship. Um, the bad news is that with numbers of hospitalizations due to the coronavirus again going up, we are not going to begin worship in the sanctuary next week, July 5th, but we are going to begin worship outdoors next week, July 5th. So for the month of July, at least, we will have outdoor worship, weather permitting. Uh, and we're going to do it earlier since it is summer and hot. At 9.30 next Sunday, July 5th, we'll gather out in front of our fellowship hall for a 30-minute worship service. And um, there are some details about wearing masks and bringing chairs and that kind of thing that many of you have received or will receive either by email or in the mail. And we're also going to put that information on our website and Facebook uh, so that you can check in on that. But if you can join us uh, for outdoor worship next Sunday, July 5th, out in front of our fellowship hall, we'll have spaces marked off so that folks can stay uh, far enough apart to be safe. Um, and the hardest thing, the, mo the biggest thing we need to ask you is please do not rush up and hug one another just because you haven't seen each other in, for, in so long. That is going to be difficult. But let us remember that by keeping our space, we are uh, protecting one another, taking care of each other as sisters and brothers in Christ um, in the case that one of us unknowingly had COVID-19. Uh, so we're excited to come back together, and we pray that we're doing it in a faithful and healthy way uh, to keep us all safe. One other announcement about worship, we are going to continue uh, recording these services that we've been doing over the past few months. Uh, we're going to record those in addition to our outdoor worship because we do know that there are a number of folks who can't attend worship in person for various reasons. Uh, some of you will wisely choose to stay home because of your own uh, health conditions, and we respect that, but we also want you to be a part of our worship life and our congregational life. So we will continue to uh, record worship services to go on our YouTube channel uh, for the foreseeable future. Now let us worship God together. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said... I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And now listen for the call to confession. No longer enslaved to sin, but set free through grace to be instruments of righteousness. We come before God to confess the ways we fail to follow Christ and neglect to care for one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, our loyalties have been divided, and we have taken your grace for granted. You seek us out, but we attempt to go our own way. You provide, but we hoard. You free us from enslavement to sin, but we neglect to be instruments of righteousness. You welcome us as we are, but we refuse to receive others in your name. Forgive what we have been, amend what we will be. Awaken us to the new thing you are doing within us and around us. Send your spirit to shape us in ways that better reflect the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. Amen. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Friends, believe the good news and be at peace. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Welcome to our young people in worship today. You know, I love stories, all kinds of stories, but in all honesty, I sometimes get frustrated with stories that don't tie up all the loose ends at the end of the story, stories that don't wrap everything up all nice and neat, that don't answer all the questions I've had as I've listened to the story. And at the same time, I realize that often it's those stories, the stories that don't answer all the questions, that are really the best stories for me because they make me think. They make me wonder about questions and how things might be. I want to share with you a story today. It comes from a book called, Does God Have a Big Toe? And these are stories about stories that we find in the Bible. They're not the exact Bible story. They, they're just stories that wonder about things that we read about in the Bible. It's written by a, a Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Mark Gelman. And so these are stories about stories that we find in the Old Testament. And this story is called Partners, and it's about uh, the beginning of the world, the creation of the world by God. Before there was anything, there was God, a few angels, and a huge swirling glob of rocks and water with no place to go. The angels asked God, why don't you clean up this mess? So God collected the rocks from the huge swirling glob and put them together in clumps and said, some of these clumps of rocks will be planets and some of these clumps of rocks will be stars and some of these rocks will be, well, just rocks. Then God collected water from the huge swirling glob and put it all together in pools of water and said, some of these pools of water will be oceans and some of these pools of water will become clouds and some of this water will be, well, just water. Then the angel said, well, God, it's neater now, but is it finished? And God said, nope. On some of the rocks, God placed growing things and creeping things and things that only God knows what they are. And when God had done all this, the angels looked at God and said, is the world finished now? And God said, nope. And God made a man and a woman from some of the water and dust and said to them, I'm tired now. Please finish the world for me. It's almost done. But the man and woman said, we can't finish the world. We can't do that alone. You have the plans and we're too little. And God said, you're big enough. But I'll tell you what, God said, I'll agree to this. If you keep trying to finish the world, I'll be your partner. The man and the woman looked at each other, and they looked at God, and they said, what's a partner? And God answered, a partner is someone you work with on a big thing that neither of you can do alone. If you have a partner, it means that you can never give up because your partner is depending on you. On the days you think that I'm not doing enough, and on the days when I think you're not doing enough, well, even on those days, we are still partners. And we must not stop trying to finish the world. That's the deal, said God. And so they all agreed to that deal. Then the angels asked God, is the world finished now? And God said, why don't you ask my partners? So what do you think? Is the world finished? 
Is God doing enough? Are we doing enough? What do you think God wants us to do today as God's partners? Let's pray. God, thank you that you created all that is out of that great big glob that you created us. And thank you that you considered us worthy enough to be your partners. Thank you for doing your part. Got us to do our part today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known? Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you? For the kindness you've shown Lord help me Jesus I'm wasted in So help me Jesus I know what I am And now Help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Try me, Lord, if you think there's a way I can try to repay all I've taken from you. Maybe, Lord, I can show someone else what I've been through myself on my way back to you. Lord, help me, Jesus. I've wasted it, so help me. Jesus, I know what I am. And now that I know that I'm needed, you so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Jesus, my soul's in your hands. As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray together. Lord, the noise around us is loud. And the distractions are intense. We yearn to hear your voice in order to know of your presence and hear again your covenant promise. Quiet our busy minds. Calm our anxious hearts. Come to us now and speak. For we are listening. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning, I don't have so much a scripture lesson for you today as I have uh, four proclamations of God's people 
about the presence of God in their lives, their experiences of the presence of God. And so here now these four proclamations of God's presence. First, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 16, we come upon Jacob who having uh, cheated his brother out of his birthright and blessing and having heard that his brother now wants to kill him, has fled into the wilderness and finds himself sleeping with a rock as a pillow in the middle of the wilderness as he runs for his life. Now Jacob has dreamt during the night of a staircase, a ladder, a a ramp going into heaven and angels ascending and descending upon it. And as he wakes up, Jacob proclaims, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And then we turn to Job. Job, who having suffered tremendous loss in his life. Job, who having been patient for a while, but now who having called upon God to make an appearance, who, who has prosecuted God, if you will, for not showing up, for allowing all of this suffering to happen to him, Job has now heard from God. God has spoken to Job. And in the last chapter of Job, chapter 42, verse 5, Job proclaims, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And then to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, we turn where some of Jesus' disciples, having witnessed Jesus' arrest, witnessed his trial, witnessed his conviction, witnessed his death on a cross, and having witnessed his being laid in the tomb dead, and having now heard that the tomb was empty on the third day, and having met along the road the presence of the risen Christ, but having not recognized him, and having conversed with him, and having welcomed him into their home, and having sat down at table with him, where they have witnessed his breaking of the bread and blessing it, they have had their eyes opened. They have recognized him as their risen Lord, upon which time he disappears from their sights, and they proclaim in Luke 24, verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And then finally, from the book of Revelation, we encounter John who having been exiled to the island of Patmos because of his declaration, his proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, experiences the presence of God in a powerful way and who proclaims in chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. A loud voice that we know was the voice of the Holy One. These are the proclamations of God's people about the presence of the living God in their lives. Thanks be to God. Joanna Adams is a retired Presbyterian minister whose most of her career was in Atlanta, Georgia. And she once preached a funeral service that is almost unimaginable. She once uh, proclaimed good news in the midst of unspeakable tragedy. And that sermon has been published and shared with the church, and it is profound and poignant. 
The story behind this sermon is that uh, while she was pastor of a church in Atlanta, an unspeakable tragedy occurred in that congregation. An unimaginable uh, pair of deaths. The story is that Mark, a young adult, was extremely mentally ill and had stopped taking his medication, had refused to take his medication, and he had become he had begun to become uh, violent and dangerous for the people around him. And in a tragic uh, circumstance, his father Jim had come to the conclusion, the unfortunate, horribly unthinkable conclusion that the only way he could protect other people was to kill his son Mark and then himself, which he did. And so Joanna Adams, as a Presbyterian pastor to this family, stepped into this terribly difficult funeral service with the task of proclaiming good news and resurrection and hope in the midst of this terrible situation. And she did an astounding job of that. Adams started her sermon that day with a reference to Reformed theologian Karl Barth, who said that people come to church on the Sabbath with only one question in their hearts and minds. And that question is, is it true? Is it true? Is the stuff that we proclaim in worship every Sunday, is it true? Is it really true that God created us and loves us as God's children? Is it really true that God forgives us and and, and calls us to new life? Is it really true that we are promised forgiveness of sins and resurrection from the dead and eternal life? Is it really true that the kingdom is coming? Is all this stuff really true? That's the question, Karl Barth said, that we all come to worship with. Is it true? Can we trust it? Can we believe it, this good news? Adams went on to say in her sermon that, that, that she agreed with that assertion of Karl Barth, but that there was another question that we often find ourselves asking. In addition to this, is it true question, we often find ourselves asking the question, why? Why do bad things happen? Why do people suffer? In her situation, preaching in the midst of that horror of that funeral with Mark and Jim both dead, why would God allow it to happen? Why was Mark so sick? Why did Jim believe that his only option was to take his son's life and his own life? Why, God? Why? We know that question well as human beings. Why do good people suffer? Why do bad things happen? Why are there hurricanes that take out entire cities? Why do people hunger in a world where there is so much food rotting in silos? Why do some people hate with such a hardness of heart? Why, God, why? Why are we experiencing this pandemic? Why do we live in a world where our lives are turned upside down to the point that we're scared to hug people that we care about dearly because we don't want to make them sick? Why does this pandemic seem to to hurt the most vulnerable people the most, people who are already struggling with illness in their lives? Why do they die so easily? Why can we not say goodbye to a member of our congregation who has died from the virus? Why can we not gather and mourn and proclaim resurrection and support a family who is grieving in the ways that we've always done? Why is the economic downturn, the economic implications of of this pandemic, why does it hurt the most vulnerable people the most, the people who can least afford to lose their jobs Why are they 
in the millions out of work, unable to feed their families or find work. Why, God, why? Why do we have to experience watching a police officer kneel so nonchalantly minute after minute on the neck of a black man who is dying so clearly? Why, Lord, why? Why do we still struggle with the issues of justice and race that we've been struggling with as a nation for longer than we've been a nation? We are so familiar with that question, why? We've been asking that question for as long as we've been human. Now, the problem with the why question is that we can't answer it. It is unanswerable, which is why we've been asking that question as long as we've been human. The biblical writers ask that question over and over and over again, from the how long, O Lord, how long of the psalmist to Job's literal prosecution of God because of the suffering that Job has experienced down to Jeremiah's lament for his people who are experiencing the judgment of God, on to Jesus' own, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he went toward the cross. God's people have been asking that question a long, long time. Why? Oh, Lord, why? And it is that unanswerable question. Now, with both of these questions in hand, the is it true question, can we trust God and God's promises question, with that question and the question, why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do people suffer? So with those two questions in hand, Adams says this, because we are human, we want to know why. But because we are only human, we cannot know why. The scripture promises us that someday we will know why, but that day is not today. God knows what we need today is not an explanation, but what we need today is faith. In the midst of Of all that we encounter in this life, Adams proclaims, what we need, and God knows it, is not the why question answered, the explanation, as much as we need the answer to the is it true question. Can we trust God's promises? Are they really true? Is it true? Adams relates in her sermon a conversation she had with Carolyn. Carolyn was the mother of Mark, the wife of Jim, the one experiencing that tragedy in ways that no one else could imagine. And leading up to the funeral, Adams relates this conversation that they had together. Joanna Adams asked Carolyn, the grieving wife and mother, how have you endured all of this? And Carolyn said, God and angels. You see, Adams proclaims, we are not dealing today with a God who comes around only when things are rosy and the birds are singing. There is a cross up there. There is a cross up there, and the God we know in Jesus Christ knows about suffering. The God we know in Jesus Christ gets to the valley of death, gets to the valley of loss and grief, gets to that valley long before we ever get there, so that God can get ready and catch us when we stumble in blindly, so that God can guide us through that dark valley. As Carolyn put it to me that day, all the way through the valley, Joanna, through the valley. You see, proclaims Adams, 
It is true that God can be trusted. It is true that God can be trusted. We cannot understand the why question. We cannot answer the why question. We've been trying for a long, long time. And I guess the truth is, how can we expect to understand it any better than Job or Jeremiah or Jesus? We can't answer the why question, but we can be astonished by the freshly bursting buds of hope that no matter how long the the winter nap has lasted, the freshly bursting buds of hope that spring forth into our lives with glorious good news, with the glorious good news that yes, it is true. God can be trusted. We are God's children. God does cherish us. God does forgive our worst sins. God does heal our deepest wounds. God does promise for us healing and new life and transformation, eternal life, and a kingdom that is coming. It is true. That is the bud of hope that springs forth from time to time in our lives to answer that most fundamental question of human life. I want to end this sermon by reading to you the last paragraph the last paragraph of Joanna Adams' sermon where she in, explains and relates an encounter she had with one of those those fresh bursting buds of hope in the midst of that terrible tragedy. Adams proclaims, I met somebody yesterday, someone I had not met before. Her name is Lauren. She is three years old. Lauren is Jim and Carolyn's granddaughter, a bright and happy, blonde-headed little, go- little girl. She wore a bib with a duck on it. And she had a ready smile on her face as she sat on Carolyn's knee, her grandmother's knee, and she met the preacher for the first time. Her grandmother said to her, Tell Joanna what you say before you have your supper, Lauren. And Lauren looked at me, a perfect stranger, and she spoke as if she was sharing with me the most wonderful news you could imagine. God is great, she said. God is good. And at that moment, I could not wait to come to church today. I could not wait to come so I could tell you what Lauren said and what the Scripture promises and what faith knows even when the pain is piercing and raw, even when the shadows fall upon our lives. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God is great. God is good. It is true. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The affirmation of faith today comes from the Confession of 1967. And this is what we believe. The reconciling work of Jesus was the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection became personal crisis and present hope for human beings when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. The new life takes shape in a community in which people know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. In our offering, we respond to God's grace with gratitude. At least at our best, 
that is how we respond with gratitude, with thankfulness, not not out of obligation or guilt or not because somebody else might be looking. But at our best, we bring our offerings to God with a thankful heart and gratitude. And so may God bless the ways, all the ways we continue to support the work of the kingdom in this congregation, outside this congregation, with the things that we have and with who we are. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we bow in prayer, humbled by the reality that you want to spend time with us. You long to be in a relationship with us. You receive us and care for us, no matter where we have been, what we have done, or how often we have neglected your will. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us. Such grace beyond our comprehension. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin and alive to the transformation you promise. Awed by your mercy and kindness, we seek to respond with bold faith. Strengthen our resolve to follow where Christ leads and obey his commandment to love. In a world overflowing with anger and division, send us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. In the wake of injustice and pain, use us as instruments of righteousness and healing. As creation groans for relief, make us bearers of hope and catalysts of life-giving change. When our faith is tested and we do not feel up to the demands of discipleship, remind us that you provide. Help us to remember the ram in the thicket, the manna in the desert, the water from the rock, and the feeding of the 5,000. Send your Holy Spirit to spark our imagination and embolden our witness so that none of your little ones are hungry or thirsty. Free from sin and alive in Christ Jesus, we pray without reserve for those people and places, circumstances and situations that weigh on our hearts and minds this day. We ask you to provide healing to the sick. We look to you to ease the suffering of those hurting in body, mind, and spirit. We plead on behalf of the long oppressed and for those still waiting for justice. We yearn for you to guide all of those in positions of leadership to make decisions that reflect your will. We rest in your compassionate presence, freed from sin, alive, and awaiting the transformation you promise. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Little Lauren proclaimed the truth of the gospel quite simply. God is great. God is good. How do we proclaim the truth of the gospel? What words of hope do we utter? What acts of love do we commit? However it is God calls us to proclaim that good news, let us go forth and do that with this good news. That the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ, His Son, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit go with us today tomorrow and every day, with us and with all God's children. Amen.